my name is Joanne Pittman, and I'm going to be the moderator of the event today. And we're very happy that you could join us for this uh, webinar entitled Confucian Shame and Christian Thinking presented by Jackson Wu. I currently serve as the Vice President for Partnerships and China Engagement for China Source. And for those of you who are not familiar with China Source, I'd like to give you a little bit of an introduction. We seek to educate and inform the global church on critical issues facing the church and ministries in China. And we facilitate collaboration between Christians inside China and outside China. We do this through online resources, through speaking, through conferences, and consulting. And you can learn more about China Source by visiting our website, www.chinasource.org. I would like to highlight one of our publications at China Source called ZG Briefs. And this is a, one of the uh, publications that I'm involved with. I'm the editor. And uh, ZG Briefs is a weekly roundup, a curated uh, newsletter of the key news stories out of China in the course of a week, uh, many of them that impact uh, the churches in China and people serving in China. And if you're not already a subscriber, we'd love to have you join us. Again, you can um, you take a scan that QR code that's on the slide, or you can visit our website to subscribe to ZG Briefs. In fact, um, I'll be working on that the rest of the afternoon. Um, we're thrilled to be hosting a global event today. And uh, we have people here from more than a dozen countries who have logged on. I did see somebody in the chat had come on from South Africa. And from where I am in Minnesota, that's probably as, as far away as you can, uh, as you can get. And uh, Jackson, as I said, Jackson Wu is our speaker today. And we're really happy to be able to, uh, to hear from Jackson. Jackson Wu, which is a pseudonym, and therefore we will not be seeing him on camera, he has a PhD in Applied Theology from Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. He has an MDiv from Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary and an MA in Philosophy from Texas A&M. And then he also studied Applied Mathematics at Texas A&M. He is currently a theologian in residence for Mission One. And prior to that, Jackson served in East Asia as a church planter and then as a professor for Chinese pastors. He's the author of three different books, uh, Saving God's Face, a Chinese Contextualization of Salvation Through Honor and Shame, One Gospel for All Nations, a Practical Approach to Biblical Contextualization, and Reading Romans with Eastern Eyes, Honor and Shame and Paul's Message and Mission. In addition, he has published journal, numerous journal, journal articles, and he's also been a regular contributor to China Source. You can find his own writings at his, at his personal blog, jacksonwu.org. Following Jackson's presentation today, we're going to be having a time of question and answer. Some of you have already submitted questions during the registration process, and those have already been submitted to Jackson for consideration. If you have any questions during this particular presentation, we ask you to submit them through the chat function. So I'm going to welcome Jackson now, turning this over to him. And thank you, Jackson, so much for being, a, being willing to do this webinar for us today. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this webinar. It's, it's very exciting to see the interest uh, in this topic. You know, a lot of people are talking about shame these days, but the interesting thing is that in light of ancient and global cultures, the ways that people recently talk about shame in the West would seem peculiar and impractical. They're peculiar because they focus on an individual's uh, inner psychology and sense of worth. They become impractical when shame is not used to shape our character. And this is why I think reflecting on Confucian ideas of shame can help us uh, help us recover a more holistic and even a biblical notion of shame. Now, what do I mean by Confucian shame? Let me define that first. A quote from the Analects captures the idea well. Confucius there says, if the people are led by laws, and uniformity among them be sought by punishments, they will try to escape punishment and have no sense of shame. If they are led by virtue, however, they will possess a sense of shame and come to you of their own accord. Also, Mencius uh, uh, adds this, whoever has no sense of shame is not human. Now, put simply, 
Laws cannot change human hearts by instilling a genuine love of virtue. That's what these, these guys are getting at. Now, one scholar and the author of Moral Psychology of Confucian Shame defines uh, this sort of shame in this way as the moral agent's concrete sense of appropriateness in her relation to others in an actual or ideal community. Okay, so the sense of appropriateness in relation to others. Uh, likewise, shame is defined as the sensitivity, this Confucian shame is the, defined as the sensitivity of appropriateness and righteousness. Now, this perspective explains why calling someone shameless is an insult both in the East and the West. A shameless person doesn't care about what others think, about others' opinion. That person's dangerous because he or she is insensitive to social sanction. Confucian philosophers like Shunzi explicitly distinguish social or external shame from inward moral sense of shame. Uh, one scholar says, according to Shunzi, a virtuous person is not shameful of not being trusted or liked by others but is ashamed of not being cultivated to her own standard of ideal moral excellence. Now, Confucian shame focuses on ideal moral self. Now, now we want to ask, but how does this relate to social shame? You know, the shame that is experienced because of the opinion of others. Now, whereas moral shame is concerned with what is right, social shame here focuses on reputation. The two are obviously intertwined, and we don't want to sharply separate them. Now, one way to relate them is this. The motivation to preserve one's reputation or standing, that is social shame, is a precursor to developing moral shame, that is sensitivity to a moral ideal. Now, as children, we seek the approval of parents and other adults. And along the way, we begin to internalize certain principles and values. Let me use a biblical analogy. Social shame is akin to the law prior to the believer's reception of the Holy Spirit. The law was an external guide helping us to relate to others around us. But shame, similar to the Holy Spirit, serves as an internal moral compass. Now, the analogy is certainly imperfect, I, I grant that, but it does highlight at least some degree of similarity and contrast. Now, there are three aspects of Confucian shame that scholars often point out. I'll just summarize them briefly. Confucian moral shame is idealized. Specifically, it is sensitive to an ideal moral authority. Second, it is internalized. Rather than external laws, it is one's conscience that affirms certain moral values. As Xun Yue says, the virtuous person has shame before oneself. Third, Confucian shame is interactive. In other words, the self is an interaction of our relationships, roles, and experiences. Therefore, uh, one scholar says, shame provides this sense of a communal self. Now, for those in China, I'll briefly just make a comparison between two key words that are translated face, mianzi and lian. And this comparison can illustrate the relationship between social shame and moral shame. While there is obviously tremendous overlap between the two ideas, lian is routinely used especially in idioms, to refer to one's moral face. Now, if you're interested in, in looking at that further, I do elaborate on this distinction between Mianzi and Lian in my book, Saving God's Face. I'll just leave that there for you to take up. And when we understand shame as a moral virtue, paradoxically, it becomes functionally equivalent to what many Westerners mean by the term honor. You know, particularly with respect to morality. Now, what do I mean by honor? A simple yet robust definition is this. Honor is a person's right to respect, 
Now, people claim a right to respect when they possess qualities deemed praiseworthy. Honor is a measure of one's worth. A right to respect could be based on two things. The first is one's character, based on living by a moral principle. The second reason we might claim a right to respect concerns perception. Now, this is referring to one's role, reputation in a community. For example, a CEO or president can have any number of moral failings, but we will still honor them based on their position. Now, just to summarize, honor can stem from one's character or our place in community. Whatever the reason, our honor determines our belonging. Now, for some, a Confucian view of shame might sound familiar, but seemingly far removed from the way that normal, or at least normal Western people, think about shame. So here's some questions. How do we relate Confucian moral shame with other concepts of shame? How does it relate to guilt? And finally, how do we link these diverse perspectives to the Bible? First, we should acknowledge that scholars in different fields talk about shame in slightly different ways. Consequently, it's really easy for us to talk past one another. And so I find that when people think about honor and shame, a lot of half-truths come to mind. Uh, people's understanding is accurate from a certain perspective, but still limited. The two most common ways of talking about shame include psychological shame and social shame. Now, psychological shame is one sense of self-worth or self-identity. This is the type of shame that Brene Brown often speaks about. Anthropologists, on the other hand, speak about social shame. This refers to a person's social worth or social identity. Uh, bullying a person or mistreating them is a way of publicly shaming them. The Bible speaks of psychological and social shame. However, it also includes a third type, what I've called sacred shame. This includes our identity or image in relation to God. Scripture alludes to each of these types of shame, so I'm not at all implying that one type of shame is more true, good, or biblical. That's not my point at all. Honor and shame are inherently relational. So these three categories merely speak to shame in relation to oneself, society, and the sacred. For a generalized definition of shame that includes these three aspects, I propose the, the following. Shame is the fear, pain, or state of being devalued according to some social standards, some criteria, whether uh, moral or otherwise. Now, this definition accounts for several types of shame, and moral shame is, is in many ways a composite of these three. It's being devalued in the eyes of one's group or oneself. In fact, being devalued in a group often leads to devaluing oneself. Now, notice that this being devalued can refer to both an emotion or a state. People naturally wonder, how is shame different than guilt? Well, not that you, we can't entirely separate them. There are a few descriptions and generalizations that we can use that can help us think through this. One common distinction is this, that guilt concerns what I do, whereas shame concerns who we are. In other words, guilt points to bad actions or doing wrong. Shame typically refers to being bad or, or wrong. Now, this is uh, the most common way that people talk about their distinction. Shame concerns one's identity. Now, in this respect, shame is a bit more holistic or encompassing. After all, actions certainly influence our identity, but identity is shaped by various factors beyond individual behaviors. Now, typically, our response to shame is more distinct or, or aggressive compared to guilt. Uh, this includes blame shifting, hiding, and defensiveness. In one study, researchers considered the moral qualities of guilt and shame, and they write that guilt may well be more closely correlated with a tendency to make up for wrongdoing, you know, making reparation. And guilt 
quote, treats the symptoms of one's moral defects, is only concerned with the defects of our actions. By contrast, shame helps people avoid wrongdoing in the first place. Also, the self-reforming tendencies associated with shame treat the cause. In shame, they write, we often focus on the faults of our character that dispose us to perform the misdeeds. So we can't simply say that one it concerns morality and the other doesn't. In many ways, shame gets to the root of a lot of moral issues. As I've said, we see all of these dimensions of shame within the Bible itself. And I defend and develop this claim in my article that I list here, Have Theologians No Sense of Shame? It was published in the 2018 issue of Themalaios. I'll let you turn to that if you want to do further study on how these various aspects of shame uh, appear in the Bible and, and how it begins to construct a helpful theology. We even see shame presented in moral as moral sensibility in the Bible. For example, Zephaniah 2.1, the Lord calls Judah's enemies shameless. Chapter 3, verse 5 adds, the Lord within her is righteous. He does no injustice. Every morning he shows forth his justice. Each dawn he does not fail, but the unjust knows no shame. Next, we'll consider how the Apostle Paul uses shame in his letters. We'll identify several strategies that we can apply to our lives. And I'll draw heavily, just so you know, from Tully Lau's recent book, Defending Shame. Certainly a book I would recommend uh, people read it if you want to do a deeper dive. First, let's look at Paul's use of shame as a tool for refuting or correcting churches. This use of shame looks backward to people's previous actions and past failures. When people think of shaming, most people think only of this usage. In Defending Shame, Lau examines Paul's letters to the Galatians and the Corinthians. In Galatians, Paul openly rebukes Peter for withdrawing from the Gentiles when the Jews came from Jerusalem. Peter's actions compromise the gospel because they communicate the idea that Gentiles must become Jews in order to be God's people. But Paul says in chapter 2, verse 11, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Certainly shaming words there. Paul uses severe language in opposing certain Galatians, even saying that some people should emasculate themselves. <laughs> For many readers, Paul seems like a bombastic American without any filter. But as we'll see, there are some principles that are guiding how Paul uses shame. Turning to 1 Corinthians, we see a church that is divided into factions. Many had turned away from Paul. They saw Paul as ineloquent. But in rejecting Paul, they turned away from a gospel that magnifies the cross. Paul seeks to subvert the Corinthians' perspective about what constitutes honor and shame. In chapter 4, Paul recounts his suffering on their behalf. He then says this, I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. At first, it appears that Paul does not see shame as a legitimate tool for influencing the Corinthian church. But Paul also confronts a church drowning in immorality. A man even sleeps with his father's mother and the congregation approves. The church is so divided that people take each other to court. I'll simply reference chapter six, where Paul turns up the heat. I won't read the whole thing. I'll, you can just take a peek to remind yourself of what it might say or what it does say. Uh, 
Paul basically talks about how uh, they are having this conflict. They're going taking each other to court, and they are actually taking their, their lawsuits to people outside the church. And in verse 5, Paul says, I say this to your shame. It seems like they have no one in the church who can deal with these matters. And so he goes on to say, why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? Uh, verse 8, but you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers. So Paul lays it on thick here. Paul uses shame in a similar way in 1 Corinthians 15, 33 and 34. He says, do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor, as is right. Do not go on sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. So, which is it, Paul? Do you want to shame the Corinthians or do you not? The first thing we want to note, actually, is that we don't need to reconcile these texts. It's not obvious in English, but Paul is actually using different words for shame depending on the context. I won't get too technical, but the next little bit, I just point out a few details for those for whom this might be helpful. He uses intrepo. Uh, when trying to admonish or discipline, instruct, teach readers. He uses another set of words um, uh, when censoring certain negative actions. The second set of words carries a lot more force. Uh, they this set of words speaks of God's judgment, such as when God puts people to shame. In other words, Paul chooses his words carefully. And he reserves the strongest shaming language to describe certain actions, not the people in the church. Certain actions, not the people in the church. And so in chapter 4, verse 14, then, what does Paul mean when he says, I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children? What does he mean? Well, first of all, Paul anticipates their reaction. He knows that they're going to feel ashamed. And this is why Paul makes the statement he does in verse 14. Paul somewhat contrasts admonishing with shaming, but the truth is really more subtle. Without getting super technical about the Greek syntax, his structure, the phrase here, where it says not to shame, but to admonish, the not but, uh, it doesn't sharply separate shame from admonishing. Rather, Paul's point here is that he does not right merely to shame them but to admonish them okay it's a matter of weight it reinforces the emphasis on the admonition his choice in greek words reinforces his intention so what can we surmise from all this i'll highlight a few principles that govern paul's use of shame and i would say should impact ours as well first we need to be mindful of our vocabulary. Don't apply your strongest language to people, but to actions. Be clear about your intentions. It's, it should not be to tear down. That shouldn't be our purpose of shaming. And Telly Loud nicely summarizes Paul's goal when he says that Paul uses shame as a pedagogical tool, a teaching tool, to transform the minds of his readers into the mind of Christ. Also, Paul reminds his readers of their identity as Christ's people. Paul tells the Corinthians that he does not seek to humiliate them. Rather, he wants to build them up. Paul considers a person's position as well. Now, keep in mind Paul's open rebuke of Peter. This was necessary because Peter's a prominent leader. and His sin was serious and it was public. The New Testament sometimes gives specific instructions for how to treat church leaders because of their special role as leaders, both in their responsibilities and their uh, prominence. Also, observe how Paul doesn't simply appeal to emotion and provocative language when using shame. Rather, he consistently uses reason and logic. When Paul refutes those who try to Judaize the Galatian church, he doesn't simply name call. He gives examples. 
he reminds them of Abraham. He even defines what he means by the word seed in chapter 3, verse 16. He provides several contrasts, and he even structures his letters with very clear logic. Now, in addition, Paul presents himself as an example worthy of imitation. In 1 Corinthians 4, 15, 16, he says, I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then be imitators of me. He then couples his own example with a reminder of his past relationship with the Galatians, as in Galatians 4, 12 to 20. Now imagine the impact were we to imitate Paul's use of shame. We can imagine our own response if others use shame in a similar way when we messed up. And I've covered a lot of ground, so let me just briefly restate these points. Be mindful of our vocabulary. Remind, Paul reminds his readers of their identity as Christ people. He considers the position of others, their role in the church, the, prom, uh, the publicness of their sin, the severity of their sin, and he consistently uses reason and logic. Now, two other things that are critical for effective and healthy shaming is setting a good example worthy of invitation and having a relationship with others. Now, I want to underscore a key point here. In every case, Paul's goal is restoration, not rejection. Comments or actions that bring shame on a person should try to draw them back into the group. Our purpose is not to push people away or to the outside. Now, we too often think of shame as the emergency break to pull when someone is about to crash into a moral manure truck. However, shame is essential for building a moral disposition. In other words, one reason for our flawed decisions is that we lack a sufficient sense of moral shame. Conversely, we make many upright moral decisions precisely because we have a proper sense of shame. In contrast, or in essence, this shame is indistinguishable from one's conscience. How do we instill and use this type of shame or what some people will call honor? First of all, it is not quickly acquired. Uh, by mere individual effort. It is a community project. As we deepen our relationships, everyone in our circle becomes more sensitive to the values that knit us together. In the process, we in the church better imbibe the sense of honor or shame that marks the Christian life. Now, where does Paul use shame in a constructive, proactive way? Not to rebuke, but to stimulate good works. Scholars often point to Philippians and to the letter to Philemon. In these letters, Paul does not focus on past failures. Rather, he seeks to foster a perspective that looks forward to avoid what is shameful and pursue what is honorable. Now, this is a primary strategy found in Philippians, where Paul lists several exemplars, such as Timothy and Epaphroditus in chapter 2. The example of Christ is foremost in Paul's mind. The Christ hymn in Philippians 2, 5 to 11, redefines conventional notions of status. I've put it here, but I won't read it all. Simply wanted to remind you of the passage I'm referring to. In the first part, he speaks of how, Paul, uh, how Christ emptied himself, became as a servant, humbled himself to the point of death. And then notice in verse 9, therefore... God highly exalted him and bestowed on him a name that is above all the names. Christ was honored through shame. According to Tully Lau, Paul constructs an alternative court of opinion that seeks to subvert the dominant culture's understanding of what is honorable and shameful. Ultimately, Christ is the basis for any honor before God. The church plays a key role in instilling those values that press us towards Christ-likeness. In his letter to Philemon, Paul writes to his friend and child in the faith, Philemon, pleading for Onesimus, a slave who ran away from Philemon and became a Christian under Paul's ministry. 
The letter shows the subtle ways that Paul frames his message without using explicit honor shame vocabulary. Paul lauds Philemon for his love and, and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. That's verse five. Paul repeatedly highlights the nature of his relationship with Philemon and with Onesimus. He calls Philemon a friend and, and a brother. At the same time, Paul calls Onesimus my child and my very heart. Paul says, I am sending him back to you, my very heart. Then in verse 20, he writes, refresh my heart in Christ. This appeal recalls verse 7, where Paul said to Philemon, I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Just as you have refreshed them, please refresh my heart. In ancient Greco-Roman culture, slaves had no honor or status. So what does Paul do? He calls himself a prisoner for Christ Jesus, verse 1. If anyone is lower than a slave, it would be a prisoner. Yet at least five times, Paul brings up his imprisonment. In other words, if you can love and accept me, you can love and accept Anisimus. Paul expressly states in verse 17, quote, if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. Paul appeals to Philemon's sense of honor and shame. In verses 8 and 9, Paul says, Though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. He then concludes the letter this way. In verse 21, Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. Finally, notice that the letter is not written to Philemon alone. Verse 4 says that it should be read to the entire church. Paul wants Philemon to be aware of the community around him. Although many people might think it's shameful to forgive a runaway slave, Paul reinforces a new perspective. In light of Christ, Onesimus no longer is a bond slave, bond servant, but more than a bond servant, a beloved brother. That's in verse 16. Now, in short, Lao summarizes saying, Paul, quote, shamed others into compliance, not by pointing out their past failures, but commending their past accomplishments. And so reminds them of the continued expectations that are placed on them. Paul frames his argument to encourage readers not only to do right things, but to do them for the right reasons. I'll conclude with a few applications stemming from what I've said. First, we can assess our own attempts to gain honor and avoid shame. What do we regard as honorable and shameful? Whose opinion matters most to us? We should talk about this with others. It's not shameful to talk about shame. In fact, it's courageous and unspeakably valuable. How might we and or God redeem our shame for the sake of honor, bringing honor to God, others, and ourselves. Motivations. We reflect on the motives that animate your life. Why do we act the way we do? Why do we try to motivate others? Or how do we try to motivate others? How might we reinforce godly desires so as to plant Christ-honoring values in our hearts? What types of identities challenge our identity in Christ? Again, examining our methods and motivations for seeking honor and avoiding shame is not something to be embarrassed about. It's simply being honest about what we all do. What about in the church? Honor and shame derive their power from relationships. They only have their significance within community. If we isolate ourselves or deny that we need other people, we should not be surprised or offended when a drought plagues our church. Isolation and individualism create social droughts that harden hearts and slowly make us uninformed or indifferent to the circumstances of others. 
when we're famished and starving for meaningful connection with others, there's a scarcity of joy. Hope dries up. Gospel seeds do not flourish in communities marked by shallow relationships. We cannot embrace American individualism and suddenly think we can use shame as a handy tool to fix others' problems. Now, this is a lengthy quote but it's so valuable that I felt like it's worth our reflection. It's on the screen. Tully Lau says this about the church. Paul envisions the community of faith as the earthly counterpart to the divine court of opinion. Its role is to maintain the plausibility structure that undergirds the gospel worldview, instilling perpetuating and reinforcing in each of its members the set of values that are established by God. Thus, believers are to resist making distinctions among themselves based on external social criteria. They are to honor and imitate those who exemplify the fundamental values of the gospel. In essence, the community re must remind itself that the basis of any true honor is Christ. Beautiful quote. How are we intentionally forming this sort of church? We shouldn't ask, what should the elders do? Instead, ask, what is our role? What is my role? Next, when we look at our own use of shame, ask, are we pushing people away or pulling people in? I won't read this whole quote, but I put it here so if somebody wants to pause the video and recording later, they can. It's from uh, Randy Richards and Rich James's recent book, Misreading Scripture with Individual's Eyes. And they make the point that shame, when it's used in a biblical way, pulls people back because they are we. When it's misused, it pushes people away as if they are no longer we. That's a helpful distinction as we think through how we use shame. Five, who are our role models? The people we admire, criticize, and ignore represent the values we think worthy of praise or shame. If we generally exalt the eloquent, hard work, affluent education, or independent spirit of certain people, we'll have a hard time instilling and reinforcing virtues like humility, interdependence, generosity, and prayer. Now, nothing is wrong with education, eloquence, or effort, not at all, but they're, they're merely tools that reflect God's grace meant to serve greater purposes. What people and virtues uh, do, we must talk about. We need to think about that. What, what, what is that we feel ashamed for more? Losing our job or not spending time with our family or, or our church? As a practical step forward, start hanging out with people around you who embody or live out the type of virtues uh, that we want to foster in ourselves. This is a strategic way to develop a right sense of honor and shame within our hearts and minds. Now, finally, I want to address the matter of church discipline. This was a common question that was raised in some of the questions that were submitted in advance how honor and shame relate to Matthew 18 and church discipline issue. Um, many people want to know how honor and shame influence this, this topic. And I can only begin to scratch the surface when addressing the issues here, but I at least want to highlight a few thoughts and you can do some further study. Many of my remarks will be drawn from Mano Emanuel's recent book, Interpersonal Reconciliation Between Christians in a Shame-Oriented Culture. Um, it's a fantastic book. And so what follows draws heavily from that excellent study. And I simply want to point out some of his observations to spur your thoughts. As a reminder, Matthew 18 where, is the passage where Jesus speaks of, if a brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between the two of you. Uh, and then he goes on, if he doesn't listen, then take others with you. So the charge can be established with witnesses, but if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church and so forth. So a little reminder there of some of the key sections. One of the things 
that Emmanuel points out is that a biblical approach to church discipline actually minimizes shame. Yes, it minimizes shame. He points out at least four ways. First, consider the person who goes to the offender. He notes, he observes that the text does not specify any certain church leaders as the ones who must confront the offender. He says, it appears that it is the ordinary member uh, of the community who must bear this responsibility, not the professionals, so to speak. You know, when ordinary lay people engage in the discipline process, they actually minimize the potential shame that might be suffered by people because it limits the exposure of the problem. Second, there's this issue of prevention. By taking up the conflict just between the two parties, you prevent escalation of the problem. How so? One, you limit gossiping, you know, the whispers that go on behind the scenes of what's, what's going on. Also, it protects against false accusation. The, uh, he says, Emmanuel says, the honor of the offender is preserved. And it might be that in private talk, the confronter is proved to be mistaken. Right? And we could be wrong. Uh, next, this process encourages uh, repentance. It's another, so it, there's prevention of shame in that sense. People in private are more prone to repent and consider what their, you know, what their response needs to be as opposed to, say, a public confrontation where people make, make it defensive. Also, it's preventative in the sense that uh, this form of church discipline or a biblical sense of church discipline confronts sin before it spreads further. Emmanuel reminds us that time does not always heal conflicts. He adds, if the sin is serious enough that we cannot overlook it, then time will not heal it. The grievance festers. The sin becomes habitual. And then timing. Sometimes we think that the three steps in the process amount to three meetings or something done in quick fashion. But he points out that uh, this one-on-one -on -one is just the first step. And when you take all the others into consideration, this could be a, a prolonged period of time. Uh, fourth, protection, taking others. Church discipline is not something to be engaged by any single person, like a pastor or even a couple people. Any single person is flawed and makes bad judgments and misspeaks. So by taking others along, the initial person who confronts an offender can, can benefit because after all, miscommunication happens and you, there's, they won't create rumors, misunderstandings, and escalation of the problem about what someone said or did. Also, God's honor is at stake. And this is why church discipline is critical, not, not silence. Right? Uh, the Corinthian church had a ton of problems. And the church, he said, shouldn't be seen to have a lower standard than society. No, the church is supposed to uh, embody the loving character of God, resisting sin that undermines flourishing and leads to death. Now, it also draws out into the community sin so that forgiveness can be extended, not merely whispers and rumors. You know, this is manifestly showing the loving character of God. You know, Bonhoeffer in The Cost of Discipleship has a good comment about the sacrificial nature of and loving nature of church discipline. He says, if any man falls into disgrace, the merciful will sacrifice his own honor to shield him, to take his shame upon themselves. And in brief, I'll, I'll review a few of the criteria for public rebuke that we've actually already addressed. The magnitude of sin and the nature of our association with them. Uh, you know, what is our relationship with them? Are they pastors, leaders in the church? And that's going to be another key factor. Uh, what's the logic of church discipline? We've already touched on it just briefly. And the idea here is, uh, is not that we're saying, hey, look, that person's bad. And we're so concerned about that individual. Rather, as Richards and James put it, um, 
that I, the supposed to the person the offender is supposed to say I have pulled all of us off center. I am part of us, and I'm influencing all of us. So it's church discipline is not a matter of just the individual and their behavior. It's that they and us are we are together. As I veer away, I pull others with me, and so it's a protection of the whole community. It's the loving of the whole community, and ultimately with time. If there's continued hard heartedness, it's the person who puts themselves outside the community. The goal is always restoration. This is a family issue. If we had family issues, we would never, uh, in, in our biological families, we would never just ignore those indefinitely. Eventually, they would have to be addressed, you know, if they're serious. Finally, churches rarely create mechanisms for restoration, bring people back into the fold. And naturally, this makes people reticent to see church discipline as anything but vengeful punishment, not restoration. So when, when that happens, when people see it as vengeful and punishment, they see it as, as a negative type of shame, not a positive restorative type of shame that helps people instill in them uh, a sense of goodness and wholeness. Now, I'll conclude at this point and open this up to a time of question and answer. Thank you, Jackson, for that wonderful presentation. Lots to think about, lots of questions coming in and um, lots of questions submitted in advance. And uh, I am trying to be mindful of the time. So um, first of all, thank you to all of you who submitted questions. Um, I don't think we're gonna be able to get to all of them, but we'll do the best we can. And I'll make sure that Jackson gets all of them in advance um, or after the, um, after the time together. Let me ask a very quick one, uh, Jackson, right off, the, right off the bat. What are the Chinese words for honor and shame? There are several of them, but uh, the most common would be rong and wu, or like zun rong would be a generic word for honor. And then uh, xiu ru and uh, chu ru would be common words for shame. I have actually a blog post. If somebody wants to do a keyword search on talking about honor and shame in Chinese, they can find all kinds of examples of how to use it and key distinctions there. Okay, and that would be jacksonwu.org? Yes. Okay. I have a series on talking about honor, shame, glory in Chinese. Okay, that's a great resource, uh, great resource for people. Um, here's a question that was submitted um, in advance. In discipling new Christian students from Confucian backgrounds, how can we incorporate healthy shame while at the same time seeing that they are healed from shame placed on them from society for not measuring up, for being imperfect physically, et cetera. Now, this is a huge question. I certainly couldn't answer here, but I would simply, I had to talk at a 10,000 level uh, level here. And I would simply refer to the example of scripture and Paul in particular here, uh, particularly, uh, the emphasis on the church, because honor and shame are so uh, oriented to one's identity and social identity. And without a healthy church, and it's, and it's honoring what is honorable and shaming what is shaming, then there's not going to be this uh, restoring of a right sense of honor and shame, a reconstituting what is honorable and shameful, such that uh, those social deficiencies, so to speak, uh, imperfections, are made as nothing. So it starts with having genuine community uh, and kind of giving up the idea of individualistic Christianity and really thinking through the health of the church. That's extremely insufficient short answer, but for our time, we'll stop there. Okay, it was a very, it was a very big question. Um, here's one that may be a little bit related and I'm gonna, I'm gonna collapse two questions together. Um, and this is a question about Confucian, the idea of Confucian ideals um, and, and thinking on the mainland. And uh, the question is, how Confucian, quote unquote, is the sense of shame among mainland Chinese today? Is there, is it con a Confucian sense of shame or is it just a, you know, be a good citizen uh, sense of shame? Uh, I, I wouldn't say that, I couldn't say we can truly distinguish them, uh, particularly when you think about Confucius's uh, philosophy and he, one of the things he wanted to do is help people be good citizens, you know? And so I can't, shouldn't, couldn't sharply distinguish them in that regard, but you have far more richness in the Chinese experience of shame, certainly this moral sense of shame. Hence, if someone said, uh, 
that is, you don't want face, but using the word Leon, the idea is that you're immoral. You know, you don't have any sense of respect, you know, moral sensibility. But of course you have, uh, you certainly have, you know, anxiety about being ashamed before others, but as a whole, the society in its relationships is a decent job of not getting themselves in a situation that's going to bring them distressing sorts of shame. You do see uh, the use of shame in parenting and in school and, and whatnot. And so it's used in a proactive sense as well. I don't know if that answers the question, uh, but you do see a, a broader range of shame used more explicitly in China than you see a lot of other places. Okay. Um, here's another question that was submitted in the chat function. People say that societies are either generally, quote, guilt and righteousness or shame, honor, or fear and power. I think many of us are familiar with those three, um, three worldview distinctions. How much do you think these distinctions are valid? And if valid, how do you think that should affect the presentation of the gospel across cultures? That, that those categories or distinctions are merely tools. Uh, they are not like any tool they are It's kind of like when you study an atom in school, uh, you know, you, early on the model was, it was basically like a planet. The nucleus was in the middle and then you have atoms or I mean, uh, you have electrons going around almost like a planet orbiting the sun. And obviously that's not completely accurate, but it, it's helpful to a very limited, but partial extent. And so, yes, that threefold, those three dimensions are helpful to some degree. I would more like to think of that as more like a color palette where you have the basic colors, three basic colors kind of all blended together and you have shades. And as you move countries and cultures, you have a little bit more, a little more yellow or a little bit more green or, or whatever it may be uh, kind of popping out. So maybe that, hopefully that's helpful. Uh, it's certainly not uh, entirely true that one culture is entirely this or entirely that. Do you have any recommendations? Like if somebody says, you know, I'm maybe I'm may, maybe somebody's new to this whole concept, um, a book or articles to just sort of begin really exploring this concept of honor and shame um, in more depth, particularly as, as particularly those who are thinking about maybe serving um, in a hmm. in an honor and shame uh, cultural context. Sure. Um... Uh, well, first off, I would say uh, look at my site for various books I've reviewed. If you type in like book reviews in the search, you'll find some things, you look in resources. That will at least prod you to some videos that I've made that will introduce you to. I do have videos, short and longer ones. That's at least one place to go. Okay. Um, also, a ministering and honor shame context by Jason Georges and Mark Baker is really helpful. Um, um, it all, it all kind of depends on how academically inclined you are and how, and how deep you want to go. Sure. And of course, your books as well would be good places. <laughs> to I, I hope so. <laughs> in, other words, in other words, what we're saying is this, this webinar is just sort of scratched the surface. And if you do want to go deeper, I do recommend Jackson's website and I do recommend his books um, for really uh, wanting to go, um, to go deeper on that. Um, I think we're gonna we're gonna just we're we're running out of time here, and I've got so many questions. There's just not not enough time to get to all of them, but I'm gonna just close with one: is that um, if you're if you're working with a Chinese uh, person, maybe a student that that is on your campus or something, what are some good good ways to begin a discussion about Confucianism and honor and shame in terms of of um, you know, with a Chinese student who maybe says, no, I'm not, Conf I don't believe in Confucian, I don't believe in religion or anything. How would you begin a conversation about, about spiritual matters and about, you know, begin a gospel com conversation with all of this in mind? Yeah, absolutely. And I do want to say, if people do submit their questions, uh, then I, it may become, I may answer it in a blog post. And so please do keep answering, throwing questions, even if we don't get to them here. Now right. to your question, to your question, um, even if someone says, I'm not formally Confucian, uh, Confucian thinking just permeates the air and culture of mainland Chinese culture. And so it, it, it's there to some form. And, and, and frequently, they may not believe in God, but even if we're speaking with someone who doesn't believe in a deity, you know, um, you know if, if we can still make some entry points because every Chinese really wants to know is this practical, this philosophy, this religion, this thing you're talking about, does it have any effect on my life? Mm 
you know, it, oftentimes people who share the gospel, the response they get from people in Chinese is, what does this have to do with me? What does that have anything concerned with my life? And so uh, engaging some of these Confucian moral ethics conversations and bring overlap into the Bible is at least a good entry point to that. And then showing how Christ changes both you exemplify, obviously, these virtues, but also how he brings change to the heart, or re- takes away our shame, restores our honor. Uh, and so uh, that's at least a good entry point to further conversation. It won't, it's not like it's going to instantly change their, their minds and hearts about all of Christianity, but at least opens for a good productive dialogue. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jackson. That was helpful. You know, any of these questions, we could just do a whole webinar on any one of them, right? Mm, truly. <laughs> like that. Well, Jackson, we're running up against a, a, a time crunch here. So I want to say thank you so much for the, for the webinar, for your presentation. Um, it was great. And, uh, and we're so grateful for you for taking the time to put this together. And I did put, the, uh, put Jackson's um, a website in the chat. It's jacksonwu.org. And uh, we hope you'll visit his site to uh, to uh, read a lot more. He's got a lot of a lot of great stuff on there, and uh, you can reach out and, and email him and interact with him through his site as well. Now, before we go, I want to uh, just highlight an upcoming event that we're going to be having uh, in the in a in the summer um, as part of a. We have joined uh, with the United States China Catholic Association. And uh, to produce a to produce a lecture series called "Exploring Christianity and Culture in China Today," China Today and Yesterday, and this is in collaboration with the United States China Catholic Association and the China Academic Consortium. And in June, China Source will be hosting the lecture, and the title is called "Christian Theology in a Chinese Idiom." reshaping the conversation and the presenter, the lecturer of that, for that event will be Dr. Jesse Sakati, who has a PhD in comparative philosophy from Hong Kong Baptist University, an MA in Chinese philosophy from Wuhan University. And he and his family lived in Wuhan for, or lived in China for 12 years. That will be on June 10th in the evening in the United States. And we ask you to watch for Watch the China Source website and email if you're subscribed to uh, China Source emails. Um, we ask you to watch for that because in the coming weeks we're going to be having um, registration details coming up from that. But do, we did want to alert you to that. And then before we go, I do want to just give you a little bit more information about how you can connect with China Source on our website. We have a lot of great resources on honor and shame, on Chinese culture, on reaching out to Chinese students. Uh, we are a donor-funded ministry, so we, if you would like to give a donation, we would be grateful for that. Um, you can subscribe to our content, which comes out Monday through Friday, um, by going to, uh, to chinasource.org. If you are into social media, you can follow us on Twitter, and you can follow us on Facebook as well. And if you have questions that you would like to submit to us at China Source, you can send an email to info at chinasource.org. But we're here with lots of uh, great resources to help you in your ministry among Chinese um, students, whether they're here or abroad or any Chinese people that you're interacting with. Um, and we'd love to have you, we'd love to have you sign up and, and become a part of our community. That would be great. And um, that's all we have for today. And I would like to again, thank you for attending this webinar this afternoon. A lot of people have been asking in the chats, is there gonna be a recording? Yes, we will be editing this recording and posting it to the China Source website, hopefully in the next few days. It will be public, so you can, you will, you'll be free to share it as widely as you want. So again, thank you, Jackson, and thank you everybody for attending. Goodbye.